tonight for your goodness, your kindness, your mercy. We thank you because you are God and you're God everywhere. Thank you how you blessed us and how you kept us, oh God. All day long, you've been our keeper, you've been our provider, you've been our shelter, you've been our way maker. And Lord, we tell you thank you. Ask you to bless us even now, Lord, as we go into your word, oh God. Hide me, hide me behind the cross, Lord, that they may see you and not me, oh God. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. We'll give your name the praise, we'll give you the glory, we'll give you the honor. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Thank God. Thank God. Amen. 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 May be seated in the presence of the Lord. I thank the Lord for another opportunity, another chance to stand before His people. I thank God for another sin prevention that God has brought us to. Give an honor to uh, my pastor and my bishop. This is John Henry Shear. Thank you so much, Bishop. Thank you so much, Bishop, for this opportunity to serve in this capacity, for seeing something in me when I didn't see it in myself. I tell you, thank you so much. To our jurisdictional supervisor, Mother Regina Rose Edwards. Thank God for her on tonight. My first sunshine in my new system was Mother Edwards, and uh, I forever uh, remember that and love Mother Edwards for treating me like I was one of her own, even back then in New Testament. Thank God for all these administrative assistants, administrative assistant Robert Harris, administrative assistant Willie Shear, administrative assistant Philip Jackson, uh, to all of these superintendents, pastors, elders, ministers, to my uh, Sunday School Field Representative, Missionary Lisa Harris. And then to the Missions Department President, Missionary Dolly Milford. And then to our newly elect lady of the Masters Department, Missionary Lane Mullen. And, and certainly uh, to uh, the man on the move, the man with a vision, the man with fire in his belly. Our chairman, the chairman of the Civil Convention, none other than Superintendent Wade Lee Bumpery, God bless you. Amen. My, my family is here, my mom and my dad. Amen. My dad, the distinguished gentleman uh, sitting there with the salt and pepper hair. That is my dad. And, uh, he thought so much of me that he tried to give me his name. So that's why I'm named Jared Lott. So I thank God for that distinguished gentleman. To his right is my mom, who was always like my best friend growing up. Yeah. Amen. And I thank God for my mom. And it's because of my mom that I, I can say that I'm part of the reason why I'm here right now. Because she would always tell me, I don't care what you do, boy, there's a calling on your life. Right. Every time I went outside and I was hanging with somebody who I shouldn't be hanging with, she said, okay, you still got a calling on your life. So after a while, I just began to listen to what mom said, and I thank God for my mom on tonight. My sister, my baby sister is here. She was singing with my daughter, Tashara, and her family, her husband, Jermaine, and my nephews, uh, J.R., or Jeremiah, and Jermaine Jr. Amen. Thank God for them. Uh, my sister, Tisha, is uh, working on tonight, so she could not be here. And then, but my nephew, uh, Little Rob, is here. Where can I go, Rob? Amen. That's my nephew. Amen. Amen. My children, and both of them are here on tonight. And that was my daughter that was singing that did the Somali solo. I thank God for Alexis. But my oldest is here. My son, Delano, is here. Come on, Delano, stand up. Amen. Amen. I thank God for that. And then, uh, if you saw me standing here 20 years ago, I probably would have been. Uh, probably weighing about, uh, about 150. I was a lightweight. And the days is coming. But somewhere along the line, over the course of 20 years, uh, this young lady that happened to be in my life would not leave the kitchen. 
and I'm going to leave the table. <laughs> so the results are standing before you. <laughs> uh, sometimes in the middle of the night, when uh, she thinks I'm asleep, I'm actually awake, and I'm just looking at her, looking at the beauty that God has provided to me. All right. That's it, Doc. Some of those nights, when she's awake and she thinks I'm asleep, I can feel her hand rubbing my head and her praying for me. And if the Lord so the latest coming, come December 4th, we will have been in holy matrimony 20 years. That's despite some people saying that we were going to make it past year two. And they said that they were getting married for all the wrong reasons. But they didn't know what I knew. Because it really was none of their business what the reasons were. But God knew. And I'm talking about that young lady sitting there with that silver hat on, Sister Tarkin's mom. That's my wife. I'm not going to be before you long. Uh, let me say my little speech, then I'm going to my seat. Uh, I thank God for uh, that lovely family over on Curtis. And God allowed me to come to And uh, they took us in and loved us like we was there all the time. That great church. Name so the, the church is so great that they had to put greater on the front. Greater Mitchell Temple Church of God. Woo! Oh, oh, oh! Woo! I thank God for all the great Mitchell Temple on tonight. If you will pray with me, um, I'm not going to uh, bore your patience. But I'm going to give you what God has given me on tonight. You go with me to 1 Samuel, the 23rd chapter, the 9th verse, and then 1 Samuel, the 30th chapter, and the 7th verse. You will find these words. 1 Samuel 23 and 9, it says, And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said to Abiathar, the priest, Bring hither the ephod. Then 1 Samuel, the 30th chapter, the 7th verse, And David said to Abiathar, the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought hither the ephod to David, and the word of the Lord is blessed. The next few moments, I'd like to share with you, talking very simply, I'll do it myself. All right. Pray, ladies. I'll do it myself. Pray, that is. If I can use a subtopic, it would simply bring me the ether. Uh, I grew up in Detroit, Detroit Road in Greenfield. Hey. Every Friday, I had a task between the summer and the fall that I'd go outside and cut the grass. I always had to make sure I did it before we were going to Friday night service. But my assignment was simply just to cut the grass. One day I asked my dad, why can't I use the edger? Why can't I edge the lawn? He told me because I'll do that myself. Because I want it the way that I want it. So I'll do it myself. The world has a very simple statement that says, if you want something done right, do it yourself. So, as I begin to study scripture, 1 Samuel, actually starting at the 22nd chapter, I begin to see a theme there between the 22nd chapter and the 30th chapter with David. Uh, David is not king at this point, but David has been anointed to be the next heir apparent to the throne. But David is on the run, running for his life. Now in the 22nd chapter, something stood out to me very interesting. 
The beginning of the 22nd chapter, it says that David has run off to hide, to get away from Saul. And people knew that David was going to be the next king on the throne. The 22nd chapter starts out saying that all of these different people began to find David, including his brothers and his mother and father. But the type of people that came to find David were people who were broke, people who were in debt people who were sick, people who were depressed. It was people with problems that made their way to find David. It's something about your anointing that people with problems have a way of finding you. You don't have to go looking for trouble. They'll bring trouble to your front yard. And David happened to be surrounded with all these people who we like to say had issues. And David got to the point where he said, listen, this is too much. So he went to the king and he said, could you please look after my mother and my father while I go and inquire of the Lord to find out what he would do for me. Yeah. See, sometimes you need to understand that there comes a time that after all these people have found their way to you, you need to get away from them to find out what God has for you. So here we are in the 23rd chapter and, and uh, is at the point where Abiathar, Ahimelech's son, who was a priest, is now following him. He has this priest with him all the time. The ephod was an important part of the priestly attire. All the priests of the Levitical order had an ephod, but only the high priest had what was called the ephod robe. Yes. Exodus 28 and 2 says that God told Moses that thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron and thy brother for glory and beauty. The beauty was outward, but the glory was to be inward. Just as we witness the church today or the temple of God today, the beauty is an outward appearance, but you have to come in to find the glory of the Lord. But this particular piece of the garment, of the priest's garment, was worn over the top and thought to be the most important part because it held the breastplate which had the 12 stones inscribed with each one of the tribes of Israel. When the people of Israel sought direction from God concerning an important issue, the high priest was the one who asked God, went before God, and as he wore this ephod and this breastplate, and when God answered, the answer was given to the high priest because he was the one wearing the ephod and the Greek breastplate. It was he that received the answer. And from the time that God set up the priestly order, we do not see anyone else dressed in an ephod except the priest. We find in 1 Samuel 2 and 18 that it says Samuel ministered before the Lord being a child girded with the linen ephod. Yeah. And the ephod was symbolic of someone who was appointed of God to minister or to serve in the tabernacle and come before him. The priest was the person who stood in intercession for the children of Israel to go before God. Yeah. Therefore, whatever it was the people needed to petition God about, they had to make their way to someone who had on an ephod. And it was someone who was usually of the Levitical priesthood who was wearing the ephod. But it was only the high priest who had the ephod robe that was able to go to God to inquire or pray. Once the high priest put on the ephod robe and fastened his girdle, it meant he was in a place of readiness to serve. Seems today that just as it was custom for the children of Israel to find a priest to go to God on their behalf, we see that in practice today. Uh, the children of Israel made it a habit that when they had an issue, they found the priest, they gave it to the priest, and they went back home as if there was nothing else to concern themselves about. And how often do we see saints today, believers, going to ministers and missionaries, the pastors, the deacons, the, the elders of the church, and ask them to pray for them, and then it stops right there. People are not praying for themselves. But they have declared that if I can just get to someone who can pray for me, someone who can pray for my spouse, someone who can pray for my children, someone who can pray for my health, someone who can pray for my family, that if I can get to someone who can get a prayer through, everything will be all right. Uh, if the pastor was to call a prayer meeting on tonight, you'd be hard pressed to get 50% of the congregants to come to the meeting. The prayer warrior is a rare 
not in how well or how good or melodic your voice is when you sing. No, it's not even in how well you know the Psalms or the Proverbs. That's not the lifeline of the saint. The lifeline of the believer is in the prayer life of the believer. Paul writes to the church of Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17 to pray without ceasing. Simply means that you are to converse and speak to God without interruption. No obstruction is to hold you from getting to God, is what the Apostle Paul was telling the church. But when we look at David, when we look at David, we find that he is a man that prays. He's a king that prays. David may have had many thoughts, but one of the things that made him a man of the God's own heart was that he was someone who consulted God. He talked with God. And he sought God for direction in prayer. David was a praying man. In 1 Samuel 1 and 23, we find where David is on the run from Saul again. Here is Saul is after David's life once again. But David hears that the Philistines have come to Keilah. And they were Keilah was a place that was in the lowland of Judah. Uh -huh. And there's something very interesting about where Keilah was because here it was, it was close to Judah, which means it was close to praise. Right. But it wasn't necessarily praise. Right. You got some people that come to church and they get close. They get close to praise. But it ain't necessarily praise. They have a form of godliness. But denying the power thereof. So here David finds out that one of his greatest enemies, the Philistines, are in Keilah, somewhere that is close to Judah. Verse 4 says that David goes and asks God, should I go there? God tells him, yes, you should go there. And he said, well, God, will I, will I be victorious? And God tells him, I'm going to deliver the Philistines into your hand. But as David is there, and he's saving these people, watch this. As David is there, and he's saving these people, a uh, bird gets to King Saul that David is in Kiyotah. And when King Saul finds out that David is there, the Bible says that King Saul says that God has delivered David into my hands because it's in a place that has gates and bars and he can't get out. And then word gets back to David that David knows that Saul knows that he's dead. And watch what David does. David goes to God in prayer and he said, God, are the people going to sell me out? Are the people that I'm saving going to tell King Saul that I'm here? God tells David, yeah, they're going to sell you out. So David gets himself together and he leaves. But just as he's getting ready to leave, David says to Abiathar, who he sees carrying the ephod, bring me the ephod. Huh? Because see, what David understood, what a lot of us don't understand, is that he needed to hear from God for himself. Uh, he did not have time to wait on the priest to go to God. He needed, so he didn't have time for someone to intercede for him. He didn't want any intercessory prayer. He wanted to pray to God for himself. Uh, David took the attitude that my dad took when I was cutting the grass. I can do this myself. Pray to me. I don't need you out here, God, to pray for me. I'm going to pray for myself. But there's something that you got to understand about what, they, what, what happened in that ninth verse. It says David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. See, you, what you don't understand is that uh, uh, David was not ignorant of what Saul was trying to do. Everyone else around David did not understand that Saul was really secretly coming after him. But David understood. I just want to stick a pen right here and let you know that those that are around you that you think are your friends are secretly practicing. Uh, when, when I look up practice mischief in the Bible, when I begin to study it out, it simply means that he had devised a plot of evil. And he had planned vicious disposition against David. Uh, the, 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 the spinners, I believe it was, had a song that they smiled in your face. And all the time they want to take your place. That's that. I know we in the church, but I have to say it all my life, so I understand. Sometimes some people will smile at you. And then as soon as you turn around, they got a dagger ready to stab you in your back. But if you turn back around, you're going to get a chance to stab 
me and shake your hand and tell you how much they love you. How great you are. How magnificent you are. What's your name, Jesus? Ah, uh, but then, let, 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 let me take my time. Ah, uh, but then just in a couple chapters later, in the 30th chapter, we find David in the same situation, but just now this is become to get be a just a little bit greater. David is now a fugitive. Now he's not just a fugitive from King Saul, but now he's a fugitive to the Philistines. Uh, because here David is with King Achish. King Achish is, 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 is getting ready to go after the children of Israel. David, in the 25th chapter of 1 Samuel, finds his way to King Achish and he tells King Achish, listen, I just want to be somewhere where I can find peace. Yeah. Tired of running. Tired of get going from this place to that place, hiding here, hiding there. And King of Kids, I don't even have to stay where you are. It, it doesn't make sense for me to be where the king is, but if you would just give me a place, I'll go wherever you get me. The King of Kids tells him, I'm going to give you Ziglag. So here David is in, in Ziklag. But then in the 30th chapter, we find out in the 29th chapter that King of Kish is getting ready to go against the children of Israel. Yeah. King of Kish loves David. Yes, he does. Appreciates David. Yeah. Even though David is a Philistine killer. Yeah. That doesn't bother King of Kish because when I read in the, in the 29th chapter, King of Kish called David his angel sent by God. He had made him his friend. So King of Kish said, listen, David, we can ready to go after the children of Israel. I want you to be by my side in war. Other Philistine lords said, this man has lost his mind. You want that Israelite to go fight those Israelites. And one of them said, don't you know that he may change and turn on us and join sides with this king and come again. So he begins telling the king of Kish, no, we don't want him. Yeah. We don't want him to go. So they tell the king of Kish, you got to send him back. Somebody even said, isn't this David, the one they were singing that said, Saul killed his thousand and David killed his ten thousand? Isn't this the same David? Yeah. King Kish said, well, it doesn't matter because he's been good to me. Right. I trust him. Yeah. Listen, let me tell you something about right there. Sometimes the people who are supposed to be against will make a way for you. Sometimes the very ones that you think don't have your best interest at heart really got your back. And they don't care what nobody say. Your character speaks for you in front of them. And regardless of what anybody else say, they don't look out for you. So King of Kish said, okay, that's all right. You all don't want them. I won't take it. But then, I want you to go back and sit down. Take you and your men and you all go back. He said, in the morning, I want you to go back to your place. Yeah. Took David two days to get back to Ziglag. And when he gets back to Ziglag, David is messed up. Because yeah. when he gets back, he finds that the, the land has been burned out. Yeah. Everything has been taken. His wife and his children, his wives and his children have been taken. Yeah. Everything they own has been taken away from them. Even the men have lost their wives and their children, and all their stuff is gone. Watch this. The men get back and they're angry, they're hurt, they're hysterical, and then they look at David and say, you caused this. And they said, we're going to stone you, David, because you ain't king yet. So ain't that keeping us from taking you out of here? David looked at the men that he was, that was following him, and David ready to do that. Yeah. David broke his elbow. Right. What do you mean, you a lot? The sixth verse of the 30th chapter said, David encouraged himself yeah. in the Lord. Yeah. And sometimes we get depressed, we get down, we get defeated, yeah. but we forget that we can break our elbow yeah. and encourage ourselves in the Lord. Yeah. And then after David got through and encouraging himself, the seventh verse said, and he said to Abiathar the priest, bring me the ephah. Uh, because David was at a point that he needed to ask God to pray. He needed to go to God and pray. And when I get into the 30th chapter, I find out that David went to God and he said quite simply, shall I go after this company of people? And will I overtake them? God responds to him and said, yeah, you 
the priest was allowed to put on the ephah. How is it David was able to put on the ephah? Well, help me, let, let me help me understand something. See, when I go back to Genesis 29, there was a woman by the name of Leah. Ah, and, and, and she had a son around the 34th verse. And she named him Levi, which means joined to. And then she had another son around the 35th verse, who which she named Judah. Now there's something about these two sons. Ah. Bless your name, Jesus. Come on, come on, come on. There's something about these two sons. Levi began to be the father of the priestly order. And Judah was the father of the one that didn't send that praise. And so when I put the two together, I found out that you got to join praise together in order to get God's attention. So here was kept a priest with him who was from the tribe of Levi and here was David himself who was from the tribe of Judah and so he kept joined to him which was praise and joined with him was praise and so anytime he needed to get a hold of God because he had the Levi with him give me what gets you in touch with God and I'm going to use my praise to get it to And so it was necessary that David was able to wear the ephod because David was a type and shadow of Jesus Christ. Because when I do my history, when I search the genealogy, it tells me that Jesus came through the tribe of Judah. Oh, bless your name. And so a Judah had to put on the ephod.
Fuego. 